Hi there. I do apologize that this is coming out to you a little bit later in the week than I had fully intended for it to be, but it's been an extremely busy week. And thank you again for understanding when things ended a little bit abruptly on Monday night. Um, all is well, uh, but it has turned into an extremely busy week, but, but all is well. So um, I thought we would spend a little bit of time uh, now uh, to kind of finish up some of that last stuff that we didn't really get a chance to talk about on Monday. And uh, it, it is going to be dealing with that session five in your book that um, you have. Uh, it, there's some really great stuff in there. And so once again, I continue to ask you to say, put that on your shelf, make some notes in it. Uh, as with all things, like the spiritual gifts test, uh, you take it every few years and you discover new insights because you've been through some stuff yourself in those few years. And so things change a little bit. And the same, I think, with this book. Uh, it's a good thing to have on your shelf and go back and reference every now and then. There are some excellent things uh, in there, both our history, uh, which is really amazing, and also some um, ways in which to look into the future for our church, for your church. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, as we pause right now, we are just so grateful for this chance to share together in a learning time, and we just ask your grace to be with us as we do so. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things that I reference are some of the really amazing people that are part of our history. Um, Rosa Parks is one, in addition to John Wesley. Um, so is Barbara Heck, who was uh, back in the day, in actually the 1700s, uh, who had been exposed to John Wesley in England to his teachings after she and her future husband had come as part of a German community that moved to Ireland was exposed there to some of the concepts that Wesley thought uh, were key parts of Christianity. I always like to, to emphasize that we are talking about a way to view Jesus, Jesus's message, and our response. Wesley uh, gave us a bit of a model of how to do things, and we're always looking for models in our life, uh, both role models and uh, kind of a checklist kind of thing. Wesley was very good at, at really at both. Um, he believed in going out into the world, and Barbara Heck was one of those people who took that very seriously. Uh, eventually, she and her husband, who was also from that small German community that had immigrated to Ireland, wound up immigrating to New York. Uh, along with some other family members of hers and uh, a lay preacher, um, exhorter. Remember that we use the term preacher very carefully in the United Methodist system. Part of that is uh, because John Wesley lived in a day when we could have those crossroad churches uh, and encouraged deeply lay leadership. And exhorter was the name that... Uh, John Wesley used for those people who were serving within the local context while living within the local context for really their entire lives. Barbara Heck, however, um, managed to make an impression in a number of places because she moved from Ireland to New York in the day before the Revolution. Remember, I've mentioned before that the United Methodist Church and the American Revolution were kind of born together. Um, so much of our polity, the way in which we handle things with the three branches of government and the three branches is the way that uh, the church functions, including indeed a judicial council that reviews all general conference changes to our book of discipline to be sure that we're staying true to course and not finding ourselves uh, wandering off into uh, something that is not part of that view, that methodical view of how we can share Jesus with the church, with the world. So at any rate, Barbara and her husband consider themselves loyalists, loyalists to the crown, and so moved from New York City to upstate New York, 
uh, her husband served in a loyalist contingent, um, was then arrested and escaped from the Patriots, and wound up moving to Canada, where they again started churches. Everywhere they went, they started these little groupings, gatherings. Today we might call them house churches. And they were those type of class meetings where she and her husband and others served as exhorters to talk to people about how they would live their Christian life, how they would would grow and expand their faith. Um, some of that material is in, in your book, um, including a definition that I would like to share with you. Um, these leaders would exhort in Sunday services by means of illumination and explanation, urging the members to live by scriptural practices. The earliest book of doctrine and discipline recognizes the office of exhorter. In the early years of Methodism in America, some lay leaders were also chosen to pastor congregations. Notice that's a term also. The exhorters were part of the laity in the congregation, uh, much like our idea today of lay servant ministry. Although the title has changed, it still remains part, an essential part, of who we are as United Methodists. Using those methods that... Um, lead us to a deeper understanding of our faith and also lead us to share that faith with others. Uh, another person that I recommend and have done so repeatedly uh, is a commentator that is still uh, available today through Bible Gateway as a free commentary. Uh, you can find him in other ways. His name is Matthew Henry. He's actually older than John Wesley and had an, his, his commentary on the Bible had an influence on John Wesley. And of course, John Wesley has an influence on us as United Methodists. So much of who we are and what we do depends on how we look at certain phrases in the Bible. How do we read them? Will, must, should, could. Those are important phrases. One of the things that our general conference argues over regularly Every four years, petitions come in, and uh, we talk about should we, shall we, must we handle things in a certain way. And always, the reference is back to biblical practices. That's why we're methodical. That's uh, why we have the name that we have, actually. Because John Wesley and his earliest followers were nicknamed Methodists, for the methods that they followed as part of their holy club that included things like fasting, that included things like um, regular attendance at meetings, uh, asking each other really tough questions to keep each other a bit in line as they do their Christian walk. When we think about what it means to be an exhorter, laying out some ideas, illuminating, explaining scriptural practices. John Wesley and Matthew Henry were people who tried to bring our lives into line with scripture, scriptural practices. The church today continues to try to do that as best we can. And of course, it's always interesting as to how we're going to do that. In your book, um, near the end of session five, around page 74, 75, 76, there's some interesting things that I would like to share with you today, uh, just to be sure we didn't get much time to talk about them the other day. Like I said, I rarely go directly to the book, but this is really important. We're talking about, in session five, how do we go out into the world? How is it that we practice hospitality. And that's a couple of pages before. You see, if we are not hospitable, if we aren't practicing the care that Jesus practiced to others, then we really are not following in the way of Christ. 
Hospitality is extremely important. However, when you're leading a group of people, when you're an exhorter, when you're in leadership, you find often that there are interesting ways in which we need to get things accomplished. Back to that whole method thing. And over time, methods change mostly because our understandings change. The rule of Christ doesn't change. The Great Commission doesn't change. Go and make disciples. I think we've spoken before that I find that make is a term that we need to tread with carefully. We are not forcing anyone to be a Christian. That is not Jesus' way. When the rich young ruler walked away, Jesus was sad, but he did not stop him from doing so. So making involves some of that method idea. Yes, how do we uh, make, like baking a cake, how do we make something out of the raw ingredients? And when we have a, a cake that we're producing, we have flour and milk and eggs and butter. And if we beat it all together, we're starting to make a cake, but we still have to add the, the oven, the heat, in order for it to be the cake that we're really anticipating to have after dinner. So there is an element of change involved. There is an element of baking, making involved. But I also like the term inviting. Some of the ways in which we have led in the past has not been all that invitational to folks. And newer methods of leading are very helpful in that. Church has changed. Part of the reason I think that it has changed is that we have changed as a culture. We're no longer isolated on the farm and looking for networking on a Sunday morning. Instead, now we're out networking more than we want to be every day through work, through social connections, through school. And so suddenly Sunday morning becomes that time when we want to spend with our family. It's the complete flip of what it used to be. Also, we have easy access to music and other input where it used to be, unless you had a piano in your home, you had to go to church in order to hear music. That is another change. So when we wonder why people are, are not in church, our society has changed. And that has also necessitated changes for us in awareness. In the in-person class, we were talking about the fact that when we're trying to work with people today, um, there are both traditional and more modern churches. My personal belief is that those two are both valuable expressions of how we share the gospel. But there's been a massive, massive shift in who we are as people. Um, I often talk about the fact that my father, his father, and his father, so my dad, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather, all farmed with the same methods when my dad was young. There had not been a massive change in how farming happened, but in my dad's time, tractors were introduced and a lot of other things. And so in three generations, there had been little change until my father's generation. Now our computers are outdated in three years. So we are in a time of rapid change. There is certainly a place for the traditional church with the steps that invite you up towards God. But there's also the place where people are much more comfortable walking in as if it's a movie theater because they've been to movie theaters before and maybe have never been to church. When we go into a new place, it's a bit anxiety producing. And so that feeling of comfort, something that Walmart and McDonald's both trade in, 
if you walk into a Walmart, you look which side of the store the pharmacy is on, and then you can find any department because they're all set up the same. McDonald's, you can go and order a sandwich, and it's going to be roughly the same. You, you just have to tell them what you want on and off it, but the basic core sandwich is the same, uh, probably even the same number on the menu. There's a familiarity there that helps us, our anxiety levels, as we navigate life. Uh, as I said, in those mid-70s pages in your book, they talk about something called the traditional problem-solving process, and also they talk about appreciative inquiry. These are important concepts to be speaking about. The traditional problem solving kind of does a little bit of blaming, actually. They start from the concept of felt need, and it's right here in your book, okay? Felt need, identifying the problem. Then analyzing the cause, which sometimes is actions by an individual, and Analysis of possible solutions, which means telling somebody how to fix what they're doing most of the time. Then action planning. That's been how the church has handled things for a long time, the method that grew up and that we used. But there's a new method out there that um, is actually still an old method, and I think much friendlier. Uh, and it makes the church and the leadership of the church a friendlier way in which to figure out how we're going to live our life in Jesus. It's called appreciative inquiry. It starts with appreciating and valuing the best of what is. Still, looking at the current situation, the what is, and looking at it with a critical eye, being aware, uh, very important. Uh, if we're constantly saying all is well, uh, there's a problem because there probably are things that could be improved. On the other hand, if we're like uh, the old story of Chicken Little running around and talking about the sky falling, if I remember the story correctly, because an apple had fallen on his head, um, that's also a problem. So we really do need to do some critical thinking as we are looking at the situations that face our church, our local congregation, the Bible study that we're leading, whatever. Um, how do we plan and time things? You've seen that just in this lay servant course alone, how interesting it is to try to put things together. Um, find the time, uh, the number of makeup sessions that have been required, that kind of thing. Uh, modern life is not quite the sky is falling, but it's a much busier world in which we live. Then in appreciative inquiry, we handle the next steps a little differently. We ask, what might be? That's envisioning. What might be? That's how the whole video concept of this course came about. What might be? How how might we do this when gathering together was restricted in COVID initially? And we've now found that what might be originally thought of uh, could be expanded into other ways in which we could adequately help others. Then, what should be? How should we go forward? That's a dialogue. How do we talk about that with others? Other leaders, other Christians, other church members, um, persons who would participate in an event. What should be? What works? Going back to those farming roots, there were many times that my family, although they were very strict about not working on a Sunday, still found that there were animals to care for on Sunday morning. So they would attend the Sunday evening gathering at their local Evangelical United Brethren Church. 
So it, there's some interesting ways in which what should be can be worked out. In dialogue, they found that was a great time for many of their farming friends to gather um, because their animals were fed and watered, they had had their day of rest, and as they prepared for the week, gathered on a Sunday evening rather than a Sunday morning. The last step in appreciative inquiry is what will be. That's the true innovating. The first person that had that Saturday night service. The innovation of what will be. How do we live into our great commission call? How do we make a difference? How do we individually and collectively move the process of inviting people to know and grow in Jesus? How do we move forward? What will be? I find that appreciative inquiry is oftentimes a much gentler way to accomplish that which we as church persons want to do, which is to not only grow the church, but to grow the faith life of our community. And perhaps that's a very important piece of who we as lay servants are. We aren't just about church leadership. We're about community leadership. We're about how do we lead people to Jesus? How do we make a difference in their lives? You see, as servant leaders in a local church, that's going to be redefined for us many, many times. The older process was a little bit more harsh because we were identifying problems. In the newer process, the appreciative inquiry process, we're looking for possibilities. Now, are there always possibilities and problems? Yes. And are there always problems with possibilities? Yes. The two are linked together. But it makes a difference of where we're keeping our eyes. Many years ago, there was an old clip um, on I guess YouTube I don't, it was out on the internet at any rate. And uh, we're all drawn and fascinated by disasters. It's part of who we are as humans. As we discussed before, part of who we are as humans involves the fact that we are uh, fearful. But that's ingrained in us for a very good reason. Because there were always in our earliest times, things to be afraid of. A fire that got out of hand, still today. Wild beasts that might sneak up behind us. Ever been camping and heard something outside the tent? So there's always still those reasons why fear is part of who we are. That means we try to lead and teach and grow, but also to protect ourselves and those around us. Those basic feelings. Well, at any rate, another basic thing that happens, just ingrained in us as humans, is the fact that where our eyes go is where we go. It's one of the basic rules of riding a motorcycle. That you have to keep your eyes where you're going, because where your eyes are is where you're going. And the clip was fascinating. Um, Yes, I have ridden and driven motorcycles. Um, so this clip was particularly fascinating to me. There was a car beside the road that was broken down. And this was a clip of the more experienced motorcycle rider behind the rider who was less experienced as they're approaching this bit of an obstacle in the road. Big obstacle. It was a car. Um and you can hear in the clip the more experienced rider behind saying, don't be watching the car, don't be watching the car. Remember, you're going to go where your eyes are looking. The experienced rider was encouraging the other rider to focus on the lane 
into which the rider needed to go to pass the car, an open lane. Instead, because the young rider was so worried about the car in his lane, he wound up actually not clearing the car. Yes, you heard that right. He slammed into this car, even though there was an entire clear lane in front of him. Because he was worried about the car, he crashed into it, even though there was a clear way around it. A classic example of where we look is where we go. If we spend too much time in looking at the problems, and we live our life in the problems, our problems are going to find us. But if we're living our life looking at the possibilities, and we find ourselves uh, much more solidly in that clear lane ahead instead of wrecking on the problem. That is the difference with appreciative inquiry and the difference that servant leaders can make. Instead of focusing on the problem, we focus on the possibility. In the church today, as you lead in whatever capacity you will be leading in, you're taking the course, so um, there will be leadership in your future, I'm sure, because there's probably already leadership in your today, as well as probably in your past. What I'm inviting you to do is to be aware that, uh, like Barbara Heck, who wound up a German descendant in Ireland and then in New York City and then in upstate New York and then in Canada, finding in each of those places possibility. Granted, there was a problem that wound up moving her from place to place to place. It wasn't just for the scenery. It was because there was something going on in her life in each of those settings or in her family's life in each of those settings that led them to move to the next setting. But instead of looking at the problem, they looked at the possibility. Well, if we do this, well, if we do that, well, if, that's possibility thinking. That's envisioning. That's dialoguing. And then implementing what um, is at least worth a try. Servant leadership encourage us, encourages us to offer things like study, that scriptural practice, to illustrate and exhort. And that is where we as a church are headed. We, we really need to be offering that to folks, to people, to, to situations. We need to be speaking into the world in which we live today. We need also to hear other exhorters, to hear those other voices that give us some possibilities. Too often, we spend our time just listening to the voices that are identifying problems. We need to also be finding ways in which we are leaning into possibility. When we are considering what it means to be a servant leader in today's world, we can look back at some of those previous leaders that looked at the possibilities in their world and said, what if and why not? As we move forward, as you move forward, I'm inviting you to, in your own way, do an appreciative inquiry process for the situations in your local church. In leadership, we are called to lead, but to discern the path ahead. We need to be aware not only of our situation, but of others. In a recent in-person class, when I was teaching this, we were talking about the fact that there's definitely the place for the traditional church, for the traditional worship. But there's also the place for the more contemporary worship. 
it does make a big difference. How we live into that. Do we continue to offer um, traditional worship at a, at a time that's convenient until there's only one or two that are coming to that? And that would be what Len Sweet, Leonard Sweet, a, 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 an author we don't hear too much about today, it was very prolific a few years ago, invites us to do. Uh, to never stop a program, to start a new one, but rather to start a new program on top of all the programming that's already there and then see. Many churches today are finding that their truly traditional worship times are dwindling while some of their other worship times are growing. But they don't discontinue until it's simply time. As you move forward, I invite you to move forward in possibility. A quick prayer. Lord, lead us, guide us, help us to see possibility as we lead and guide in your name. I hope you've enjoyed the course. Blessings. Have a great day.